All right. Thanks, uh, Pastor Kenneth. I appreciate that. And we have so many good things going on. And I want to echo just the thanks for the support um, for the, the fireworks fundraiser. Uh, it's going to be such an exciting night um, as there's not many, many firework shows happening in the area. And so we're believing that this will be a great tool to reach people um, with the gospel and to enjoy um, just time being together as a church and as a community. So thank you for doing that. Uh, we are finishing our series today uh, called Break the Cycle, and uh, we've been talking about how we can start breaking the cycle of this back and forth fighting and the division that exists in our country, especially when it comes to the racial tension that we're, we're facing right now. Now, I've been asking you to not listen to this message series uh, with your political ears, but to listen with your gospel-tuned ears, because for those of us that are followers of Jesus, we must always look at people through the lens of the gospel to, to really see people how God sees them, even if they look at things differently than we do. So how can we break the cycle of, of this division and this chaos and, and unrest and this violence? Well, two weeks ago, we talked about the church needing to listen with love, that it all starts with love and this idea that every person is created in the image of God and that everyone has tremendous value. And then last week, we talked about how we need to embrace the idea of godly justice. That simply put, justice means to set things right and that God is always just because it's part of his character. So just as when Jesus was on earth that he brought about justice, followers of Christ are also to seek justice for those who are being treated unjustly. So I'd like to finish up our series today by focusing on a story in the Old Testament from chapter 5 of the book of Joshua. And, and I feel like I have a message from the Lord that has a little bit of maybe a prophetic bent to it today. So just to give you a little background to the story, the, the nation of Israel, they had come out of Egypt and come out of slavery, and, and Moses had, had led them through the Red Sea and, you know, survived the, the ten plagues and all that, and they were on their way to the promised land that God had for them, but they got derailed, and they ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years with really no permanent home. And so their leader, Moses, as we pick up the story, he's now dead and a man named Joshua was appointed the new leader of Israel. So Joshua started leading them, and, and God miraculously stopped the flow of the Jordan River so that the Israelites could cross over and finally enter this promised land, the land of Canaan. Now, the season changed. Instead of wandering, they would spend the next season fighting and driving out the wicked people from the cities of Canaan so that they could reclaim this promised land uh, for the Lord and so that they could have a permanent home. So the Israelites were in position to start advancing into Canaan, and the first city that they needed to take down was the city of Jericho. This was basically the most impenetrable city in all of Canaan because it had these massive walls they were so thick and wide that you could drive a chariot on top of the wall. It was that strong and that wide. So we pick up the story here in Joshua 5 where Joshua is gonna, he's going to scope out Jericho, maybe as like a nighttime spy run or, or something like that, probably just to try to figure out how in the world are we going to take this city with all these fortified defenses. But Joshua ends up having an encounter with someone whom he never dreamed that he would meet. So let's pick it up in verse 13 of Joshua 5. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So when I, when I read this passage, I think one of the most obvious questions here is, Who is this man that Joshua meets, this mysterious encounter? 
Well, verse 14 tells us that he is the commander of the army of the Lord, but we don't really get his name here. However, there's a few clues that tell us who he is, and it might actually really surprise you if you've never studied this before. Believe it or not, this man was actually God himself. He was God in the flesh, in the form of a man. We call this the the pre-incarnate manifestation of God. We call it a theophany. It, it happened a, a few times in the, in the Old Testament, long before Jesus was ever born in, in, on this earth. So Joshua, in this moment, he's witnessing God in the flesh, the, the logos, the word of God, who's later identified in John chapter 1 as the son of God, as Jesus himself. As John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is God Well, how do we know? It's actually pretty simple because there's a couple major clues in verses 14 and 15. The first first one is that Joshua, when he has this encounter, he falls face down and he worships this man. Now, if if this man were an angel, he would have rejected the idea of being worshipped. And he would have told Joshua to stop immediately. See, that's what angels did in, in other parts of the Bible where where they, someone had an encounter with them and they, they immediately started worshiping them, well, the angel would then say, stop, I, I, I do not deserve worship. I am a servant of God like you. So that's, that's one major clue. The, the second major clue is in verse 15, when the man tells Joshua to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. Now, if you're familiar with some of the story of the Israelites and if you, especially of Moses' story, then that language probably sounds pretty familiar to you because that was the same exact thing was said. God said the same exact thing to Moses at the burning bush. He said, take off your sandals for you're on holy ground. This is God. The only explanation that makes sense is that Joshua wasn't just talking to a man. He wasn't just talking to an angel, but he was talking to a holy God in the form of a man in this mysterious encounter. In addition to to being God, did you notice in the verse about the man's posture? Did you notice what he was doing? Verse 13 tells us that he was standing in front of Joshua with a drawn sword in his hand. That's, That's an aggressive stance. That means he's ready to fight. It's it's either a position of standing guard in defense and protecting something or someone, or it's a position of offense and being ready to attack. The question was whether he was there to fight with Joshua or against him. So Joshua asked him in verse 13, are you for us or are you for our enemies? So Joshua was concerned, but even, even though he was concerned, it still had to have taken a lot of courage to just walk up to this man, sword drawn, and just start talking to him. And his question of whose side are you on, that seems like a good question, right? I mean, doesn't Joshua need to know if this man is fighting for him or against him? See, Joshua thought, like we do, that the battles that we face are ours to handle, and people are either for us or against us. That there's no other option, that sides have to be chosen. And, and human tendency, especially in our American mindset, is to view life's battles from an individualistic perspective. That it's, it's my causes, it's my concerns, it's my agenda, it's my battle. The problem for Joshua here is that there was a, a bigger agenda at work, and he didn't see it. And sometimes we don't see it either the bigger picture of what God is doing. So the man, really the, the Lord, we should say, responds to Joshua's question about if he's on Joshua's side. He responds in two parts. First, he simply says, neither. Whose side are you on, mine or theirs? Neither. It's like the Lord just simply denies both of Joshua's options. Another way to translate that word neither is just the word no. No. Joshua says, are you on our side or their side? And and the Lord just says, no, neither. It's like he's he's asking the wrong questions. I mean, why why didn't the angel, why didn't, or not the angel, why didn't the Lord say to him, hey, 
I'm here for you. I'm, I'm on your side. I'm here for Israel. We're going to get the victory today. Instead, with his sword in his hand, he said, I'm not really here to take sides. Not your side or their side or anyone's side, except for the Lord's. In a sense, he really doesn't even answer Joshua's question. Why? Because it's not the right question. The question really wasn't if the Lord was on Joshua's side. The real question was if Joshua was on the Lord's side. So my question today is, whose side are you on? So the second part of, of the Lord's answer to Joshua, first he said, who, the question was, whose side are you on? He said, neither. And the second response he said was, but as the Lord's, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. In other words, I'm not here to take sides, but I'm here to take over and take charge as commander of the army of the Lord. This was a position of authority and power. And the implication here isn't just that he's the commander of the army of the Israelites that are back behind Joshua. That, that there's, a, there's a bigger, broader, more powerful um, aspect to this. That this commander, this man, was over the heavenly army of the Lord. A much more powerful and supernatural army. It's no wonder that Joshua then immediately just fell face down and surrendered and submitted himself. I can imagine what, what Joshua felt that day as he first approached this mysterious man. Just He's completely in control of the situation. He's planning out things. He's got his, his strategy. And he's approaching this man totally in control and ready to, to assess this guy and, and to persuade him to join in the fight with him if possible, or if he wasn't going to, if he was going to be against, then maybe Joshua was, pre was prepared to enact judgment on this man. I think in a similar way, sometimes when we pray, we approach God like we already have an agenda in mind, and the goal is just to get God to be on our side, to see it the way we see it, that if we could just pray enough times or pray long enough or, or use the right wording or use a, you have our voice shake when we talk like this and we're going to pray. If we just if we get too excited and we got all these ways that we try to get God on our side. But that's not the way it works. Apostle John tells us in 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything, he hears us. Now, you may not have your Bible in front of you to see, but I skipped a part because it's, it's better. It sounds better. It feels better that if we ask anything, he hears us. Basically, you ask it, he's going to do it. Well, that's not the total verse. I'll read it the way it's supposed to be read, the less fun way, okay? This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's the key phrase in the middle, according to his will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and he acts on our behalf. Even if we're not always aware of it, sometimes we pray with the hope that we can get God to see things the way we see them because we're right. And we, we want God to fight with us against the people who are wrong and, and who we've determined are the enemy. But let's not forget that our real enemy and our real battle isn't with people that we come in contact with or people that we watch or people that we listen to or work with. Our real battle is not with the mainstream media. Our real battle is not with the police. It's not against activist groups. Our real battle is not against millennials or against the poor or country folk. It's not against politicians. Our battle's not against the rich. Our battle's not against liberals or immigrants. Our battle's not against the scientific community or conservatives or city people or the educated or the environmental people or the oil industry. Our battle's not against professional athletes' salaries. It's not against Hollywood all of which are being blamed at some level 
for the problems in our country. The Apostle Paul tells us exactly who our real battle is with. Many of you probably know this passage. It's from Ephesians 6, verse 12, which is our next verse in our Bible study on Wednesdays, by the way. It says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. There's a lot packed in that verse, that there's a whole dimension, a whole realm that we don't see, that we're not aware of all the time of what's happening. Did you, did you catch all that? Evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. There's mighty powers in this dark world. Evil spirits in heavenly places. And even though we can't usually literally see these spiritual beings and we can't see these supernatural battles happening uh, in, the, in the spiritual world between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, we do see the results of those battles and those beings manifested in our world in different ways. You know, I know how it is. Sometimes it's hard to see what God is doing behind the scenes. It's hard to see what God is up to when you're talking about spiritual warfare and things in the spirit world. But that's why we as humans and as followers of Jesus, that we ask for wisdom and clarity and that we walk in humility instead of arrogance and acting like we've got it all figured out and wrapped up nice and tight and just walking with that proud arrogance. But we walk with humility, realizing that there's so much we don't know and understand. We walk with grace instead of judgment on people, that we, we allow people to have space, that we Give people space to, to be themselves, to grow. And that we have an open heart instead of a closed off heart or a hardened heart, as Scripture talked about. We have a soft heart. Now, going back to the story from Joshua, we find out in chapter 6, just the very next chapter, that God did help the Israelites conquer Jericho. And that's a whole other story with the really crazy way that they conquered Jericho, if you've never heard it or read it. Read Joshua 6. It's like nothing you've ever heard before. And so God did help them, and, and, and he helped them conquer Jericho, which was impossible. And so someone might wonder about this story with this encounter with this man, that why didn't God just answer Joshua, hey, yes, I'm, I'm on your side. Why didn't he just say that? Because it seems like in the end he was. He helped them win, right? So why didn't he just come out with it? Tell them he was on their side. Well, I believe it's because God sees down the road and he understands that these circumstances really are about our hearts. And there's a deeper, deeper thing happening. And, and I think he wanted them to have a certain understanding before they ever fought their first battle in Canaan. That he wanted to teach them and train them in a certain way. And teach them a principle that would carry them for years and years. And the principle was this, that God does not submit to anyone's plan or agenda, no matter how right the cause seems to be. I want to let that sink in. I want to say that, say that again. God does not submit to anyone's plan or agenda, no matter how right the cause seems to be. Instead, God invites people to join in his plan, in his agenda, which is much larger and much more powerful than any, anything that anyone can come up with, certainly what Joshua had in mind that day. He would have never anticipated how they were going to beat Jericho. God wanted Joshua and the, the people of Israel to acknowledge God's lordship, his authority over them. Like I said earlier, a lot of times we approach our battles and our causes backwards, that we try to get God to support us rather than for us to submit to and follow God and what he's doing and where he's leading. In Joshua's case, God reminded him that it wasn't Joshua's battle. It wasn't even Joshua's plan. In fact, Joshua was tapping into God's larger plan as he submitted to the Lord. 
Now, we see that by God's grace that the battle was won by a partnership, which is amazingly how God works, that he actually includes us in his plan, that this partnership between God and between the people of Israel under Joshua's leadership. But Joshua, as well as all of the children of God, must be following the Lord and submitting to his authority and taking our orders from him and and putting the battle in his hands, because it's really his anyways. Joshua seemed to understand this as he asked the man with the, the drawn sword, what message does my Lord have for his servant? He immediately realized what was going on here, and he submitted himself. What message does my Lord have for me? He's asking the Lord for orders, which he received the very next few verses. Sometimes they get overlooked that this man or the Lord was there, and and it doesn't say that he left, but he immediately started in with the plan of this is what you're going to do to conquer Jericho. So let's respond to God like Joshua did with worship, and with submission. In verse 15, the Lord said to Joshua, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And so Joshua did so. See, removing sandals was was a sign of servanthood, and it was a sign of respect and submission. See, Christ isn't just powerful enough to be our redeeming Savior, which is incredible, that he bought us back. He paid the price for sin, and that's so important. But, it, but he, he's even, even more beyond that. He's powerful enough to be our victorious Savior, to save us from the schemes of the enemy, all of his plotting and planning, which always, always, always is to steal and to kill and to destroy. But... We can only experience God del- God's deliverance when we take on a humble posture and we submit to his authority, that we walk in grace and humility, not in pride and arrogance and dominance and control. So here's the thing. I really believe that God is inviting us into a different way. That he's inviting us to a different way. You could say that it's a third way to live, in which the question that really matters would goes, it goes beyond uh, politics and it goes beyond personal experiences and, and worldview and comfort level and your upbringing or your culture or your age. It goes beyond all of that. And the question that really matters that I have to ask myself all the time that I believe the Lord wants all of us to be aware of is just simply the question, Am I on God's side? Am I on God's side? It's not about my side or our side and their side. It's not option A or option B. What I'm telling you is that there is an option C. And it flows out of a life that is lived with Jesus Christ at the center, letting him affect how you engage in every area of your life. It's striving to be on God's side, to follow him. To follow him in all things, no matter what people think or no matter what side of the political aisle that different issues land on. No matter what, just what feels good. Remember, it's about the gospel, which is the good news that Jesus has come, that God has come to us, that he is alive, that he is risen from the dead, and that he is a God of grace and truth, full of grace, yet full of truth, that he is a God of mercy, praise the Lord, but he's also a God of justice. He's God of grace and truth, and he is a God of justice and mercy. There is no one like our God that can be those things at the same time. So let's be weird. Let's, let's just be weird. Let's not be normal because normal isn't working. It's not working. What many of us do and how we live and, and our responses to what's happening in our culture just continues the cycle. The normal responses just are not working. 
if the church will rise up with a new voice, with a different way, with a third way, and say, follow us this way, because the Lord is moving this way. We can shed some of the labels and the camps and the sides and the dividing lines, and we can live a different way. Let's be weird. Let's first and foremost be labeled as fully devoted followers of Jesus before we label ourselves anything else. Let's start there. Let's love people that we totally disagree with. Is that even possible in our culture right now? Can I love and be connected to and appreciate and value someone that I totally disagree with and be gracious to them because they're created in the image of God? Let's love. Let's listen to those that are hurting, regardless of whether or not we think they should be hurting. Let's listen to those that are hurting. Let's work for justice, working for making things right. Let's work for peace. Let's work for civility in our communities, in our society, in our country, and in our world. And let's trust the Lord and follow wherever he leads, even if he leads us into uncomfortable places, places that we've never been and never thought we'd be. Maybe then we can see this destructive cycle in our country start to break. That is what God has placed on my heart because I feel like God is saying that that's what's on his heart, that he's grieved at the division. He's, he's grieved at the violence. He's grieved at the judgment and the hatred. He's grieved on all fronts. And so we can grieve with him. Like we said last week, that it's about being grieved, not about feeling guilty. That we can lament what's happening. And we can pray. So church, above all things that we would do, the number one thing we need to do is pray. Because that is our weapon in spiritual warfare. The word of God and prayer. So as we close today, I just, I can't see you, but I'm just believing that God is stirring in your heart. If you'll receive it, if you'll be open to it, some may not. Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And I'm praying that your ears will hear through, through the gospel lens what the Lord is doing and that he'll chip away at your heart like he's been chipping away at mine. That he'll bring you to a place of brokenness where you realize that you don't have anything. I don't have anything. Everything that I have is dependent upon the Lord. Without him, I fall, I fail. I'm broken and lost and just a lost sinner without him. If you don't know Jesus and you're watching today, he is the ultimate God of love and peace and justice. And that if you're in pain or you feel like you've been the victim of something, there's a God who restores and who heals. And he's reaching out to you through his Holy Spirit. You can receive him right now. You don't have to go through some big religious process. You can just call out to him wherever you are. If you're in your house or your car or wherever, you can say, Jesus, are you real? Are you out there? Can you hear me? I need you. I need help because I'm hurting. So let's pray together. And let's pray for this cycle to be broken in Jesus' name. Can we do that? If you don't mind just joining me in your home, just take a moment and pray. Lord, I feel your Holy Spirit even here right now in this room. I feel your momentum. And Lord, you're calling us you're drawing us, and you, you're wanting us to call out to you. So right now, I'm just calling out to you, Lord. I pray for the, the healing oil of the Holy Spirit to come. Come to our country. Come to those, even who are watching today, who are in pain. Or people that are angry. Even those that struggle to be humble. Even those that are, that are proud. I pray for the walls to come down right now in Jesus' name that you would pull back the veil and you would show us
who we really are without you. And that there would be a whole new way of being. I pray for those in our country that are being treated unjustly. Lord, this is not of you and this is not your heart. I pray that you would break down the systems that, that treat people as if they are less than. I pray for a new way to emerge, that we are created equal in your sight, that you give us wisdom in how to address these things, where to go, what to say. We pray for protection for people that are at risk right now. We pray for our police. God, we pray your angels around them, that wherever they go, whatever situations they find themselves in, that your holy angels would protect them from people who are out to do them harm. We pray for an encouragement to come to them, that they would find rest in your Holy Spirit, that you help us know how to bless them as well and appreciate them. We pray for our politicians on, on all sides, Lord. God, we want to see a, just a, a revelation of God in our political system that would supersede any of our, our ideologies or our policies or laws or s structures or any of that, that you would show up, Lord, and that we would all fall face down like Joshua did. And it wouldn't be about whose side we're on but or whose side you're on, but that we would be on your side and follow you. We pray for our own hearts that we would that we would find the healing that we need. That the pain that we carry, that you would heal us, Lord. And that something new would be born. Plant a seed right now of a new way. We ask you to seal this, this work that you're doing with your Holy Spirit, that it would not be taken, that the seed would not be stolen, but that it would go down into good soil and bear much fruit right here in our church and in our country, Lord. Much good fruit would be born. We just pray it. We speak it out. We claim it, Lord, prophetically, that you are moving and you have a new place for us. We'll follow you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you again for watching and being a part, for joining in this series. If you've been here for all three weeks, if not, you can go back and catch up. I know it's been a tough series. It's one of the toughest that I have ever preached in my life. Wrestling with these things and dealing with them in my own heart, much less trying to communicate them to you. I realize that I'm not a perfect person. I'm not a perfect communicator. But I hope that you heard God's word through all of it and that you're able to sift through and receive what you need to move forward. But again, I'll ask you, let's be weird because normal isn't working. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you go be a light in the darkness. Amen and amen. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great week. Take care.